On Monday, 11th of March 1907, Thomas Dennison was brought before the magistrates at Haslingdon after having been charged on suspicion of murdering his wife, Margaret Dennison, at some point during the evening of Saturday, 9th of March. Standing before the bench and facing Alderman Hamilton, who was the chairman, as well as Messrs Holt, Law and R.W. Porritt, Thomas showed little agitation, and when asked if he had anything to say, he simply replied, She did it herself. I never touched the woman. Thomas, aged 49, and Margaret, aged 56, had only recently moved into the third floor of 10 Cobb Castle Hutch Bank the month before on the 2nd of February, having previously spent time at Hoyle's Lodging House in Haslingdon. Both had travelled over from the suburban area of Idle in Bradford, Yorkshire, during the August of 1906. On the afternoon of Saturday 9th of March, Thomas, whom had been employed as a stormmason by the Bury and District Joint Water Board to work on one of the reservoirs over on Haslingdon Grain, after having arrived back home, he gave his wife Margaret eight shillings to help buy groceries. He then went off to help some other men remove a hen coop from an area known as Underbank and to relocate it at Hutchbank, both areas of which were close to where Thomas and Margaret lived. By 5pm that afternoon, and having done his chores for the day, Thomas made his way to his local pub, which was situated at the end of Cobb Castle Road. The Dyer's Arms, also known as The Flip, was a small pub that saw plenty of trade by the way of local workers, as it was nicely situated within the middle of what was a heavily saturated area of textile and cotton mills. The landlord was also the ninth mayor of Haslingdon, Robert Taylor. Now Thomas spent the next three or so hours drinking and singing, with one of his favourite songs being In Days of Old When Nights Were Bold, and it wasn't until just after 7.30pm that Margaret would come looking for him. Is our Thomas here? she asked Taylor, landlord, to which he replied yes. Now noticing how wet Margaret was, as the rain had been falling for pretty much the entirety of the day and had gotten much worse as the evening had worn on, he asked her if she would like to go into a room, presumably where there may have been a fire burning, and she would have been able to keep warm. Aye, I will stay a minute, she told Taylor. So whilst the landlord went to fetch her husband, Margaret sat herself down and enjoyed a glass of stout which she had already poured for her. Upon entering the tap room, Taylor informed Thomas that his wife was waiting for him in the next room, and Thomas replied saying he would first drink up his beer and then go and see her. It was shortly after 8 o'clock when Thomas and Margaret both left the Dyer's Arms, and they began to make their way up the relatively steep incline that led to their home on Cobb Castle Road. Now it's unclear as to what happened next between the couple, as within minutes of leaving the pub, Thomas was seen to be punching Margaret. 19-year-old John Bridge, who lived at Hutchbank, told of leaving his house at around 8 or 5 p.m., and as he went in the direction of the Dyer's Arms, he had seen Thomas seemingly beating Margaret close to Flip Road. Margaret fell to the ground, but she never called out. And with her head facing the wall and lying on her right side, Thomas then began to kick at her. John shouted over to Thomas, saying he should be ashamed of himself paling a woman like that. Looking up, Thomas shouted something back on the lines of giving John the same as he had given her Margaret. Thomas left Margaret on the floor and started to make his way up the road, and John would go on to help Margaret back onto her feet, and in doing so, she said to John, He has hoined me. Now Margaret then slowly began to stagger up the road, albeit using the wall as a support to stop her from falling over again. John then made his way to the Dyer's Arms, where he would inform the landlord, Robert Taylor, of what had just happened outside. Other witnesses also came out of the houses, with Sarah Bridge, wife of John, also seeing the savage beating Thomas was giving to Margaret. She recalled hearing Thomas say that he would learn her over spending his wages, but he seemed very eager to get her up off the ground and to get home. Sarah went over to help Thomas lift her off the ground, with Thomas on one side of Margaret and Sarah on the other. However, as they got further up the road, Thomas seemingly struck Margaret with his right hand whilst holding her with his left. Now, she didn't fall or stumble, but Thomas was still grumbling about his wages, to which Sarah said to him, Well, don't hit her now, talk to her in the morning. Thomas wouldn't listen, instead he struck Margaret several times more, and when Sarah left them, they were stood next to a well. Now Sarah had only been back at home for a few minutes, before a neighbour, Mrs Altham, came in and spoke of a commotion going on up the road. So coming back out, Sarah made her way to Thomas and went on to check Margaret. Oh, leave me alone, she told Sarah. Thomas took hold of Margaret and seemed anxious to get her home, and at one point he was seen dragging her up the road by her heels. Leave that woman alone, she's only a handful. If there is any law, I will go against you, Sarah shouted over to Thomas. Thomas muttered something back, but Sarah couldn't make out what it was. Meanwhile, two other witnesses were coming along the same road. Both William Howarth and James Cunliffe approached Sarah, Thomas and Margaret, with Sarah telling them he has been kicking her. 
William Howarth was one of the men who Thomas had spent the early afternoon with when removing the hen coop from Underbank, and then a little later, around six o'clock, he also remembered seeing Thomas at the Dyer's Arms. William replied, Give over, Tom. Fearing that Thomas may turn against William, Sarah quickly interrupted with, Don't interfere between man and wife. Now at this point, Thomas turned to the small group and said, She has spent my wages, before facing Margaret and threatening her, I will learn thee. Thomas again began striking Margaret several times with his fist whilst trying to get her up the road. What happened once Thomas and Margaret had disappeared out of sight and heading up towards Cobcastle Road is unclear, but at a quarter to eleven and having left the Dyer's arms, James Cunliffe and John Bridge told the police that they had seen Margaret lying insensibly in the road halfway up from where the Dyer's arms was. Thinking she was drunk, they just walked past her and left her there. She was just 120 yards from her own home. The following morning, Thomas walked to find his wife missing. After getting dressed, he left his home and made his way down to Cog Castle Road, and that's when he came across the body of Margaret. So panic set in, and not knowing what to do, he made his way over to his friend William Nuttall, who lived at nearby Todd Hall. I missed my wife and got up and went down the road and found her dead, Thomas told William. So obviously, William would have been in a state of shock, and both men quickly made their way through a plantation which led out onto Cog Castle Road and to where Margaret's body was lying. Not too long after, and at six o'clock that morning, John Yates, who also resided at number 10 Cobb Castle Road, heard a banging on his door. It was Thomas who was visibly agitated. This is a caution, he said. I have been down the lane and she's dead. I have been over to Todd Hall to build nut holes. Who, the wife? asked John. If that be so, it's a caution. You have to go after a policeman. Thomas heeded these words of advice and quickly made his way to Haslingdon, where he met PC Turner on Bury Road. Now this was just after 7am. PC Turner and Thomas returned back to Cobb Castle Road and to where the body of Margaret was still lying. She was lying on her back with her head facing up the hill. Her face and clothing were covered in mud. Her clothes were also in a disarranged state. Now the top skirt was torn right down the centre and her hat was lying about two yards higher up the road. Her shawl was torn into two pieces and lying close to her hat. Strangely, PC Turner would state on record that he saw no signs of a struggle saying that the rain had fallen throughout the night and it would have washed away any kind of evidence. And considering several witnesses, at least four that we now know of, all saw Thomas punching and kicking Margaret, to say there was no signs of a struggle seems a strange statement to come out with. PC Turner called for the advice of PC Fisher, who arrived shortly after 8.30am, and after examining the body, PC Fisher described as finding the body as being badly bruised, with the head, face, arms and legs being bruised and discoloured. After making some inquiries, he charged Thomas on suspicion of having caused the death of his wife, Margaret, to which Thomas replied, I have nothing to say, she's caused it herself. On Monday the 18th of March, the hearing into the death of Margaret Denison would take place in Haslingdon. The hearing would last for just over 11 hours, with a 75 minute break for lunch and another 40 minutes for a tea break. John Yates, Sarah Bridge, William Howarth and James Cunliffe, as well as several other witnesses would all be cross-examined. Police constables Turner and Fisher would also be called to the stands, as would two more witnesses who would prove to be of importance, Joseph Connolly and James Perry. Connolly was a mason's labourer who resided at the Bird in Hand, Church Street, and he would say that on the day of the tragedy, himself, and along with Thomas, both men left work at 12 noon and made their way to the Wellington Inn on Graham Road, where they had two beers. Here they met James Perry. And at around 1.30pm, and after leaving the Wellington Inn, all three men arrived at Cobb Castle where they met Margaret. They stayed at Thomas's house for around 20 minutes before making their way down to the Dyer's Arms where all three had two more pints of beer. At around 2.30pm Thomas would then go and help move the hen coop which we've already spoken about, but he returned back at the Dyer's Arms shortly around 5pm where he stayed until around 6pm and in that time he had drunk a further four pints. Now James Perry would verify the story that Joseph Connolly had given as evidence and added that whilst all three men were at Thomas's house, he remembered seeing Thomas pass some money to Margaret, and they were talking about furnishing their home. The coroner was next to take to the stand, and he would detail the injuries that Margaret had sustained. The scalp of her head was beaten into a pulpy state. The skull was also fractured, and although it was difficult to surmise just how the fracture occurred, the doctor's view was that it was consistent with a kick from a boot. There was a cut three quarters of an inch long on her head, and her body was covered over with a great mass of bruises. Both eyes were blackened, the cheeks were bruised, 
and there were marks under the parts of the arms, apparently inflicted when she was protecting her head. Under these circumstances, it was not surprising that she had died. The bench retired for consultation, and upon their return, the clerk read over to Thomas the charge of willfully murdering his wife. Thomas stood in the dock and replied in a firm manner, I am not guilty. The bench, however, seemed to wane, and after some more consideration, they felt that, after listening to all the witness statements and looking at the evidence put before them, they felt that no British jury would come to the conclusion that Thomas was indeed guilty of murder, but only that of manslaughter. Upon hearing this admission, one of Thomas's daughters, who had been listening intently throughout the hearing and who was nursing a child, fainted, and as she was taken from the court, another of his younger daughters became hysterical and cried, I want to go to my dad's, as she was led out. Meanwhile, Thomas sat back down and a huge sigh of relief overcame him. Smiling, he looked up at the crowd in the gallery who were clapping and showing their delight at the verdict in a loud fashion. Thomas Dennison would be committed to the Manchester Assizes where the case would be heard before the Grand Jury on the 22nd of April 1907. Before Mr Joseph Pickford and the jury, Thomas was charged on two accounts, one of having murdered his wife and the other of manslaughter of his wife, Margaret. Mr Pope and Mr Hewitt, who represented the Crown, gave a full and detailed description of the events of Saturday the 9th of March. And after hearing all of the evidence provided and listening to the witness statements from people such as all those we have spoke about, the jury would find Thomas guilty on the murder of his wife, Margaret. However, the judge made a statement to the effect that he thought Thomas and Margaret had been drunk on the evening of the attack, and it was hard to find who was at fault for the events that took place. Mr Pope would speak to the jury, saying that the case was one which had so many sordid details that it could affect one's view. He would also say that it could not be said that Margaret was drunk, and it could not be said that Thomas was very drunk. The assault was a continuous assault along the road. Defending Thomas was Mr Gibbons. Now he would tell the jury that there was no real defence, except for the fact that Thomas was a man of good character. He had been happily married for the past 30 years, as well as holding a stable job for the same employer for the past 12 years. So whilst perhaps having the odd altercation with police for being drunk, he was otherwise a friendly character. Mr Pickford told the jury that whilst he could not instruct them on which verdict to give, he made it clear to them that they had to be sure if what had happened on the 9th of March was indeed a case of murder or manslaughter. Mr Pope, in facing the jury himself, announced that there was no evidence to convict Thomas of willful murder and that the verdicts of manslaughter would be the best recourse. He would argue that Thomas never meant to kill his wife, but drink was to blame. And whilst he may not have been totally drunk, he was sufficiently drunk to not really be conscious of what he was doing. Now what may seem a strange statement to make, Mr Pope went on saying to the jury that whilst Thomas was conscious of kicking Margaret, he was also conscious of beating her, but he wasn't conscious enough to realise the full extent of the injuries he was inflicting upon her. And in a conflicting way, Mr Pope, it seems, tried to pass the blame over to Margaret by commenting that she was probably not sober, although probably not drunk. And even one newspaper, the Haslinden Gazette, even reported that the wife was in some small measure to blame because she herself might have annoyed him by taking too much drink. Mr Pope would also ask Thomas to plead guilty to the charge of manslaughter, which would obviously lead to a lighter sentence other than that by death by hanging. Thomas didn't need asking twice and he agreed to the charge asked of him. In summoning up, Mr Pickford also raised questions as to the manner of the witnesses' actions on the evening of the attack, and he hoped they were all telling the truth as to what really happened, because if they thought Thomas was intending to hurt Margaret, then their actions were as callous and bad in the extreme. Why didn't they help the woman up off the road? Why didn't they separate Thomas and Margaret when he was beating her? Why didn't they take Margaret into one of their own homes to protect her? The jury, after retiring, came back into court and the verdicts of manslaughter, as thought would be the case, was given. And taking Thomas's relatively good character into consideration, and after hearing all the evidence laid before him, Mr Pickford would sentence Thomas to just 12 years penal servitude for causing the death of his wife, Margaret Dennison. Looking at this story, it seems incredible that, although it's clearly obvious that both parties had been drunk on the evening the tragic event took place, Margaret was at one point actually being blamed for potentially provoking Thomas into such a frenzied attack upon her. It's a sad story, and one that could so easily have been averted if only one of the witnesses had stepped in to help. <music> Margaret's funeral would take place at 2 o'clock on Thursday, March the 14th, 1907. Attended by her two daughters, her body would be interred within the grounds of Haslinden Cemetery at Grain Road, 
Her grave is marked as C1000. So thank you very much for listening. I hope you enjoyed this story. And if you want more, please show some support and comment down below if you are listening to it from my website. These stories are also available on several other platforms, such as Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, CastBox, as well as many others. And if you are listening to us via one of these platforms, I cannot thank you enough. You can also follow me on Twitter and on Instagram, links which are down below. But in the meantime, take care, and I'll be back soon with another tale from the past. Thank you.